Um, today, I'm going to be talking about zero knowledge proofs and how zero knowledge proofs kind of enable a beautiful coexistence of privacy and transpa transparency. First off, my name is Anna Rose, and I'm the co host of a podcast called Zero Knowledge Podcast. I also throw an event called the Zero Knowledge Summit, and the next one will be in San Francisco on October 26th, so I hope to see you there. Just FYI, I have a podcast. I'm not so used to giving public speaking where there's no editing, so please bear with me. <laughs> All right, I'm speaking, this is B10, and I believe this is the privacy track. So I'm sure you've already had the zero knowledge proof defined for you. I'm assuming that most of you know it. But in case you don't, uh, zero knowledge proof is a technique for showing that a statement is true without revealing any additional information other than the fact that the statement is true. So for example, if I know a password, I could potentially prove to you that I know a password without revealing what that password is. You just know that it is true. Um, with zero knowledge proofs, you'll have a prover and a verifier. The underlying information is kept secret, private. The verifier knows that the information is accurate despite not having an entire picture. And in this case, there's no need for a third party to act as a certi certifier that this is true. The zero knowledge proof itself, the cryptographic in underpinnings, are what confirm uh, the truth of the statement. So here's a little example. Later tonight, I might want to go to a bar. I might want to go to a karaoke bar, actually. And I learned that the drinking age here in Japan is 20. Now, I'm way over 20, but I may, I may want to prove that I'm over 20 without revealing my age. And I could potentially do that with a zero knowledge proof. So here, the bouncer would know that I am over 20, but he wouldn't actually know my age. Okay, so in this talk, I'm gonna be outlining sort of privacy in blockchain, as well as transparency in blockchain and how uh, zero knowledge proof interact with both of those. So first, let's talk about privacy. <clears throat> so privacy in the blockchain. Blockchain isn't actually private on its own, but adding zero knowledge proofs can make uh, the transactions on the blockchain private. So the most famous, uh, sort of the first example of this was the zero cash paper written in 2014, where they actually proposed a model that allowed for confidential payments. Um, since then, there's been a lot of protocols that have emerged where they're using uh, this kind of underlying idea and they're creating, you know, like for example Zcash, they're creating a shielded account model. And what that actually means, so going back to my example with the bouncer, if I have to pay my cover, um, I could potentially pay the cover uh, from my account to the bar's account and no other information would be made obvious to the bar's account. For example, the bar would not know what I've transferred before or what I plan on doing in the future. The bar would not know my balance. And yet, using a zero knowledge proof, I could guarantee that there's no double spend. So I could guarantee that I have those five tokens that I'm transferring and that I haven't transferred five tokens twice. Um, <coughs> although five tokens for an entry, if it's zero now, if it's Zcash, would be very, very expensive. So I'm hoping that my night tonight's not gonna be that, that bad. <coughs> All right, so in a traditional payment system, this makes total sense. Like, you should not have to reveal what you've done before and what you've done after. And like, say I was a business and I paid your invoice, I would not want you to then be able to see other invoices I've paid uh, in the past or plan to pay in the future. And so here we can see why privacy is valuable for the blockchain. And I think if we want blockchain to be adopted on a large scale, it definitely needs to be secure, accurate, but private. Okay, so now let's talk about transparency in the blockchain. <clears throat> when you think about like Bitcoin and other distributed open blockchains, you will see all the transfers being made. And even though it's just account numbers, there are, I mean, I think we all know this, there are methods for tracking money on blockchain, either using on and off ramps like exchanges or cracking mixer-like systems. There are like, there's analytics companies dedicated entirely just to figuring out who's who on the blockchain. In fact, criminals have been caught because they use Bitcoin, not despite it. And that's actually a really good thing. Like, transparency is a, is a good thing. You can actually um, see all of the holdings, you can see all the transactions. If you want, you can actually t like, keep an authentic copy of the ledger. Transactions are immutable and you can see them yourself. 
In this case, you can actually audit any transaction, and there's no middleman needed. And that means you know where your tokens are going, how they're being used, and who touches them. But if you think back to the traditional financial world, large banks and other institutions will use customers' funds in ways that the user may not be aware of, and in ways that the user would never want. And so there's definitely value in this transparency into these larger systems. And this is why transparency is valuable for the blockchain. Okay, so now I've outlined the tension between these two forces. There's privacy and there's transparency. There's privacy, we want our, you know, we want some of our data to be confidential. We also want some key information to be verifiable and auditable. And even though it seems contradictory, zero knowledge proofs and blockchain enable both of these things. It's kind of cool. So, yeah, in this example, so what, what I want to do now is talk about a few examples of how zero knowledge proofs and blockchain could potentially help with compliance and trust building for the end user. Now, when I was preparing these slides and this presentation, I wanted to use examples from like healthcare or voting or even taxes, but in fact, a lot of those are not very developed. And so instead, the focus of these examples are in the financial sector. And I think it makes sense because there's so much activity on chain that could be verified. It's like, it's all the numbers are there. And so I think a lot of these systems will first emerge through the financial sector. Um, I want to talk to start about compliance. Uh, this is probably a bit of a dirty word here in this audience, but I, I think this is actually really cool. Like, what you could do with zero knowledge proofs is you could potentially cryptographically prove, like a fund could cryptographically prove that it's operating compliantly without having to disclose all the details of their actions. And at the same time, regulators could be given visibility <coughs> into general fund information but not access to other confidential stuff like investing activities, LPs, or terms. Um, a lot of these examples come from a specific project called Fendora. Uh, actually, this talk was inspired a little bit by Ben Fish, who is one of the co-founders of Fendora. In one of, I think I did an interview with him, and in that interview, he just sort of mentioned like how you could actually use zero knowledge proofs to do um, selective disclosure. And I think that is one of the powers of this, of this technology. And Fedora, what they actually do is they use zero-knowledge proofs and multi-party computation, which is a related and equally powerful tool to provide both privacy and transparency. And I think the key here is the selective disclosure. It's not that everything is transparent, and it's not that everything is kept private. You actually can allow certain information through and keep other information private. Um, so the first example that I want to share is this idea of ensuring KYC. So KYC, know your customer. This is something that you need to do if you're running an exchange, if you're buying cryptocurrency, if you're doing investments. Um, what you could do here is actually prove that a participant has passed a KYC by a third party. So what you do is you basically take a whitelist and a whitelist of addresses and sort of your selection of addresses, match that, and then provide a proof saying like this like, these addresses are on the whitelist. However, you wouldn't actually be disclosing which addresses, how many addresses, you wouldn't, no one looking from the outside would be able to tell who on that list has been kind of let through. And so here you see this selective disclosure. So another one would be to prevent capital management fraud. Um, funds could demonstrate statements about flows in and out from addresses belonging to investors versus investments, and this could actually prevent Ponzi scheme and embezzlement. So another example would be, or sort of a couple examples, are providing better business practices for trust building. So here's another example where you could communicate better with investors. So you could actually share more information without revealing the details. You could provide a liquidity profile of a fund's current asset holdings using a public database of assets and liquidity profiles. You could share general information about a fund's asset without disclosing which assets are actually held. Or you could do something like a proof of solvency where you could actually demonstrate that the value of asset-backed backed tokens, um, the value of the tokens actually exceed the liabilities, meaning like the fund is solvent. It actually has the funds it says. And you could actually do that without revealing how much or what they are. And this is a really exciting example, which is you could actually use a zero knowledge proof 
to issue stocks on a ledger, and you could actually track these through secondary trades. Except to the outside, no one would necessarily know that you are tracking them. You could see where they're going, but outwardly, like, no one else could see where they're going. They wouldn't be able to track them, only you'd be able to track them. And you can actually do that using zero knowledge proofs as well. So some other use cases that I kind of mentioned quickly before, and like in general this talk is very much trying to find ways for us to think about the power of zero knowledge proofs, and I hope that this actually could inspire you to think about more ideas. And so other ideas that have been floated are things like taxes and auditing, supply chain management and voting. There is a project called ZK Ledger from MIT where they did a lot of work on the auditing front, but as far as I know, there's no implementations yet. And in general, a lot of this stuff will need like, I mean, you'll have to get a lot of authorities and regulators on board. I sort of picture it being a combined effort between funds and regulators. I don't think it would just come from industry um, if that was to happen, but I think it could be really powerful. Cool. So yeah, I hope that this talk has helped you to explain, I hope that I've explained a little bit how valuable zero knowledge proofs could be for our personal and professional lives, and uh, yeah, and how it provides this much needed balance between privacy and transparency. And before I end, I wanna say a big thank you to Ben Fish, as I mentioned, from Fendora, because he really helped me work on this talk and come up with those points. Um, I think their project's pretty cool. I don't work for them, but I, just, I think they inspired this, so yeah, I wanna say thank you to them. One last thing, uh, this was a very high level talk. The Zero Knowledge Summit is something that I'm throwing in San Francisco at the end of the month, October 26th. If you're into that, if you're there, please apply. That will have actually some of the best researchers around talking about the details of their protocols and so I hope that you will consider coming. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any questions, this is, or if you actually, if you have any comments, if you have any ideas, that would be really interesting to hear. Also, I think there's only one microphone. So, do you want to come up? Yeah. Uh, ZKH Nax, implemented in the Serum of Virtual Machine Dog. Could you do a transaction inside the Serum which uses zero knowledge? Inside the what? Hmm? Inside the Serum of Virtual Machine. Inside So, well, I know that there's a lot of projects that are building on top of the Ethereum virtual machine using zero knowledge proof stuff. And I'm sure you could do private transactions with them. But I think what we're talking about here is actually, it's, it's constructions using zero knowledge proofs, and as I mentioned, also MPCs. So it's like, you'd actually design systems that allow for the selective disclosure. And I, I think you could probably build things like that on Ethereum, but right now, I don't know of any projects that are. Yeah? Nine and three quarters is for that. Sorry? Nine, Ethereum 9 and 3 quarters is for private transaction on Ethereum using Mimble and Bolt. Oh, is that a project you're, you're shilling right now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's it called? Oh. Ethereum 9 and 3 quarters. 9 and 3 quarters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh hey. Any other, uh, no, no, any no. other questions yeah. or comments or thoughts? Uh, combine using GitHub. It's a common. So we are uh, as well working with undisclosed uh, exactly. government to discuss the possibility of applying zero knowledge proofs for the taxes. And uh, I would say that it is um, absolutely a challenge to convince a financial ministry to uh, uh, use this technology. It's a completely uh, another level of challenge. So uh, all of these in this auditory understand the power of their knowledge proofs, but you need to prove it yeah. <laughs> for the government. That's that's actually one of the reasons why I, like I don't totally see it coming from industry and like having industry pitch it to government, but rather like sort of through education or through like evangelizing these ideas, potentially have people within those bodies come up with those ideas themselves which may be good or bad, but I think it's good that we keep an eye on it. Uh, I have a full lot comment on that. Um, not that I supported, but I think in Singapore, the monetary authority did launch a um, kind of like a national level project, blockchain, um, and one of the implementations is using zero knowledge proof. So using quorum and zero knowledge proof uh, for interbank 
uh, settlements. Yeah, so I guess it depends on the kind of government. Yeah. So, I mean, just, just to give an example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be curious to hear exactly what they're doing there, because I mean, zero knowledge proofs can be powerful for all sorts of things, but here what I'm talking about is like compliance, where like some information is revealed and some is kept private. So I, I like I'd be curious to hear exactly where they use it. That's the thing is like there are actually examples in healthcare of zero knowledge proofs, but so far there's no examples of zero knowledge proofs and blockchain that are like really working in the way that a hospital would need it to. <laughs> or, or maybe you have a counter example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can pull up on the Singapore's project moving. So oh, yeah, essentially okay. they are doing a kind of real time cross settlement for um, uh, between banks and uh, so this is kind of, they have tested on using their own knowledge proof on top of this. So uh, that's between banks. Yes, yes. And uh, I think the first prototypes they are using CK Stark on Coro. So Coro is an enterprise blockchain. So yeah, and they are also later latest like anonymous NASA and all those designs can be applied on EVM based I'd be curious to hear from that example if there are actually, like, is that designed by regulators or is that designed by a consortium of banks? Yeah, so this, like, yeah, so regulator is kind of interested in this, so okay. it's definitely not, uh, so, so, but in order for this kind of case to really go live, they need a privacy feature, so okay. they need the industry to so fix the solution, yeah. Yes, yes. I, um, yeah, I was a bit involved. So it was basically like a call from the government. There were three industry implementations that they funded to do it. And they, after that, they evaluate and publish the results and then they iterate to a higher and higher level. Oh, are we of three minutes left? Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or ideas? If not, then uh, thank you for listening. And yeah, I hope this I hope you think about these ideas. I hope you guys figure out ways to use them.